I just shared screen. Yes. Okay. All right. So I know this is the last talk of a very long day. <laughs> it is completely modular. It is also like half a YouTube channel where it's like the biological world according to me. So I'm gonna say a bunch of bombastic stuff. I'm gonna say the strong form of the stuff I'm usually not afraid to say, except after a few beers, but like I figure like a long meeting together is like drinking at the bar together. So feel free to stop. Uh, it's meant to be kind of provocative, um, um, hopefully spur some discussion and hopefully you find it somewhat interesting. So I will take all arguments with me as a compliment to so don't be afraid to tell me I'm an idiot. Um, I pretty much believe that about myself anyway in many dimensions. Um, so, um, so randomness, complexity, and the biological frontier. So I think, um, so I started off with peers doing HBAR stuff and I almost quit physics. <laughs> and I, at the end of my PhD, and that's the honest truth. Not with peers, but not that. But I mean, in the Rutgers thing group. And Anirvan Sangupta came and kind of um, made me think about biology. And so I think I just have to justify my choices to do theory and biology, because I always feel like, uh, in many ways, like uh, I'm, I'm fallen, you know. And God knows my PhD advisors think I, a PhD advisor thinks I'm an idiot for leaving one plus one CFT exactly solvable models. But um, but um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start with uh, what I think is interesting. So what I'm gonna tell you about is biology, and I guess this is more theoretical biology than theoretical physics. Um, and so of course, biological complexity is ubiquitous. This is some diagram of metabolism which is how we extract energy from the world. And it looks very complicated because I think that's what it's supposed to do. And then the only point is that if you zoom in, it looks even more complicated, <laughs> right? Um, and, and you know, honestly, I've been doing this long enough that the words on this chart actually mean something to me, which is really surprising because <laughs> when I started using this as an example, like 15 years ago, I was like, ah. you know, but now, <laughs> now much more. So I, you know, and I think, the point is that like you open up a science or nature paper and you get a lot of figures like this, right? And what you usually take away from it is it's lots of things, it's very complicated, and we're going out and measuring all of them, you know, of various kinds. So this is like, you know, some UMAP, which is a dimensional reduction in things of cell types this is gonna come back. You know, uh, this is some co-localization of things, you get very complicated stuff, right? You have genes, you have names, and I think the overall impression is supposed to tell you every detail matters, it's all complicated, um, you know, it's very different from what physics is doing, right? And I think this is the point, right? And I think this is what I would call the Ernest May, Ernest May view of biology, which is that, you know, it's really not physics. It's just very different, and it's different because it has heterogeneous components, it's out of equilibrium, it's matter with function, it's a historical product of evolution, so how dare you, you know, we, what, what, what does physics have to say? And, um, and this is especially true, you know, for the kind of problems I like to think about, which are very different from anything anyone has talked about here. And these are things where symmetry, forces, and energy functionals just don't appear anywhere. So I think many people are now abandoning the energy functionals because we work out of equilibrium. But I think there is still this tendency for physicists to want to not abandon symmetry and forces, as we saw today. And so what I find fascinating about theoretic, doing whatever I do uh, is, is the idea of how can we do theory that looks like physics where we don't have access to the modern pillars of theoretical physics. And I would say that many in the community are abandoning some of these, but the question is, can you do anything when all of them are abandoned? So that's, that, that's, that's kind of kind of what I find fascinating about all this. Um, yeah, not clear how to do theory, I would say, that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, do we need theory? So when I go talk to a biologist, and I talk to many biologists, many friends, very close friends, many arguments, right? Um, the overall sentiment, I would say, of the community is we just need to do better measurements, do some statistics, and now we're gonna, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna ask our AI overlords to interpret everything, right? And so I asked my AI overlord, you know, <laughs> does, 
biology need theory? And this is what my, well, this is a, this is like a minor deity now. He's been surpassed, you know? Uh, <laughs> I have to re-ask my AI overlord. My AI overlord has evolved in the last two years. Um, it says, yes, biology needs theory to explain the complex phenomena of living organisms. Theories provide a framework for organizing and interpreting data, and they help researchers to generate testable hypotheses that make and make predictions about future observations. So it's a boilerplate answer. It's great. Like at least the AI overlords don't think I should be unemployed yet. So then I asked it a more uh, more pointed question, which is that if I could measure everything about a system, would I know how it works? And it gives me this answer. If you were able to measure everything about a system, you would have a comprehensive understanding of its current state, but you might, may not necessarily know exactly how it works. All right. While careful measurement is important in understanding a system, there may be underlying processes or mechanisms that are not immediately observable or measurable. Additionally, even with a complete set of measurements, it may be difficult to discern causality and relationships between different components of the system. But it basically says, OK, you might have all the information, but you don't really have all the information. There's some causality that's missing. but in principle, the ideology is that if I knew everything that went into its evolution, if I could measure everything, then I would know everything. But my counterexample is actually chat GPT itself. <laughs> because we know every connection, we know every piece of data it was trained on, we can measure every parameter precisely. There is not a person in the world that can tell you how it does what it does. Right? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. So, so, so I would say that this hope of pinning everything on better measurements and better things, if we know it, that somehow things are going to just work themselves out, I would say is misguided. And this is, you know, an example where I think it's very clear that that's true. We can really tell you everything about that thing, right? It's completely reproducible once I fix the random seed. <laughs> so, um, so how do we deal with this biological complexity? And did I miss it? Yeah. So I, I think what the tack, one of the tacks we've been doing in the group is to take inspiration from something old. And really, I started thinking about this. Ironically, if someone asked something about quantum, I started thinking about this because I was talking to my friend Anatoly, my good friend Anatoly Polkovnikov, about the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, right? which is this thing about how eigenstates thermalize. And one of the things you take away after you think about it wrong, long enough is that there is this kind of very something interesting in StatMech, this whole different line of StatMech, which depends on typicality. And you know, the most famous example of, was of uranium by Wigner in 1954, three, I don't know, sometime, sometime long enough ago that I don't have to get the year right, I just have to get the decade right in the 50s, right? And what he said was, look, of course I know this thing is derived by the, described by the Schrodinger equation, but this, Uranium is too complicated. It has like, you know, I don't know, 92 protons. I don't know the rest of them, but like a lot of neutrons of the same order of magnitude. And there's no chance I'm ever going to be able to solve the Schrodinger equation for this. So he came up with this kind of ridiculous ansatz, which was that I'm going to take all this complexity and I'll replace it by a random symmetric matrix, right? And what's amazing about this, I think most of you know this story, is that... You, this is that actually it was able to really quantitatively reproduce some aspects of the data. So this is a old neutron scattering experiment where they, you know, where they fire stuff at the nucleuses of uranium, and you can see at certain energies, you get these big peaks, and these peaks correspond to the energy levels of the nucleus. You can measure the distance between these peaks, and what you see is that. They actually follow what now is known as the Wigner surmise. And basically, this is the same thing you get from a random matrix with one constraint. And that one constraint is that it has to be symmetric or, un or Hermitian, whatever you want to call it. And what that constraint enforces is unitarity. Right? So as soon as I put the right physical constraint in, which is unitarity, I can replace all the complexity by randomness, and I can at least predict produce some aspects of the data. Right? And this is because anything big enough looks typical. Right? This, is, this is the basic idea of this thing. And, you know, let us skip this. All right. So the basic idea. But it wouldn't tell you that it was a good nucleus for making a bomb or not. 
Well, we're not. <laughs> we're there's, there's things they can predict, right. and there's things they can't predict. No, uh, no, depends no. On what, depends on what depends the fact that it's a good for making a bomb. If it's just the interest space between yeah. the peaks, then it's good enough. Right. I, th I, think, I, I think I just wanted to make the point that complexity, certain aspects of complexity, follow just from the typicality of the distribution, sure. right? Other things are very specific and depend on all the details, for sure, right? So, um, and this should say probably some, but the basic concepts we've been trying to, a basic uh, inspirational thing we've been talking about is should the properties of complex biological systems should also be well discussed, described by appropriately chosen, quote unquote, random systems. But the caveat is that we have to get the essential biology or ecology, as I'll show you, right, right? And these are the, what I would call biological constraints. So once we satisfy the constraints, we can replace all the complexity with randomness and at least some of the very coarse grain patterns that you, that, 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 that you measure should be easily explainable or reproducible or you should be able to help tell people how to plot data Right? You should be able to do all these things. So, um, so exactly, the idea is complex systems equals random systems plus constraints, and there's no need for any of the stuff I needed. Right? So this is the one place where physicists made a big impact, where they didn't need an energy functional, really. They didn't need symmetry, and they didn't need any forces. All right. So what I'm going to show you is um, two examples of where we've been doing this for a long time. This is old. Uh, most of what I'm gonna show you here is from a science paper that now is surprisingly influential <laughs> in 2018, with, done with my uh, good friend Alvaro Sanchez, led by Joshua Goldford, um, and then some other stuff with Wenping, who is here at the KITP. He's a, he's a postdoc here with Boris. You should talk to, he's very shy for those of you who are local, but he's really, really smart. You should engage with him. <laughs> um, and, and my former postdoc, Bobby Marsland, who's now training to be a priest at the Vatican. Uh, which, uh, he's, he's one of, it's very ironic because uh, he's training to be, anyway, it doesn't matter, right? We have very different, <laughs> we have very different world views. Some of you know me, know I'm a crazy Marxist. So, um, so uh, oh, he was always religious. He was always religious. He was deeply, deep, he's one of the most, he's a wonderful person. He's one of the most thoughtful people you'll ever meet. But I, uh, um, and it was fun to have someone who thinks so differently about you in some spheres of life, but you work together in others. It's, 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 a, it's a real charming, yeah. it's a very charming thing to have in life, right? Uh, um, um, so let me start with how this works in practice. Um, we have many more papers than this. I should have updated this slide. My current student, Sarah, is also working on this. So uh, science is a collective project. All these people contributed. I'm just up here probably distorting what they think. Um, um, so I think one of the things we know about ecology that's fundamental to self-reproduction is that microbial ecology is shaped, shaped by metabolism. And what metabolism is that you eat some molecules with some high energy electrons and you spit out some other molecules with lower energy electrons and you extract some of the energy and use it to grow. All right. And what people had really, for some reason, not appreciated so much before we did this work is that perhaps there's two things that are quite interesting about this. One is that I should really think about this in a high dimensional space. That metabolism, the natural molecule, molecular space they live in is quite high dimensional. You know, you think about glucose, but the point is that even if I put in glucose here, the bacteria eats it, it produces all spectrum of metabolites that come out. And those metabolites can then actually be reconsumed by the bacteria. And this is true really on a kind of coarse-grained level, right? We're gonna to try to really make more coarse-grained models that correspond to the kind of sequencing people do, as opposed to like in a monoculture. So we're gonna to try to work in this high dimensional thing. And the idea that we thought about is do this in high dimensions and take metabolic cross-feeding seriously. And so the reason this is, sounds so awful is because this graph I showed you is really this process here, right? It's a, it's a, it sounds awful. And so what do we do? Well, what we do is we take inspiration from Wigner and we do something very, very stupid, which is that we just kind of replace the preferences that bacteria have. So each bacteria has some preference for some metabolism by one random matrix. Then I take this metabolism, which I view as a matrix that takes in metabolites and spits out other molecules as another random matrix. And then I just plug this into 
a dynamical system that kind of conserves energy and has a basic growth balance thing. So this is like, you can imagine I have a bunch of bacteria labeled by I, their abundance, it, they grow proportional to how much energy they can consume, they die, right? And then the resources, you know, exist in the environment. And then the important point is that there's these fluxes in and these fluxes out, and these are random matrices. And there's some stuff that in this audience, I don't really have to get into, but this is like a really large high dimensional system of ODEs that are nonlinear. What do you assume about your matrices? Yeah, that's the, that's the essential, essential. <laughs> that, that, thank you, Piers. It's like I almost planted you. Yes. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about this model in relation to like the classic Bob May stuff? And yeah, the Bob May stuff is not here, but this is more like a MacArthur Levins model. Yeah. So if I, if I, if I took this out, then this would be essentially a variation of a MacArthur consumer resource model. But usually those are very much analyzed in low dimensions, right? One or two. So if you look at Tillman and all that stuff, it's like very much one or two dimensions. So there's two changes we've made. One of them you can see very obviously, which is that we put in cross feeding. That's why we call it the metabolic consumer resource model. But the second thing we're gonna really do is take these to be large so that we can think of these as random. Because if I have two species or two metabolites, it's not gonna really, we have no justification for replacing this by random stuff. How large? Uh, 10 is thermodynamic, right? That's what everyone knows in physics. But in, in practice, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I mean, as long as it's 20, 30, you can do it. Now we actually, I actually did a whole cavity calculation. So I can actually solve this at model analytically with cavity, it, it, it's a tour de force. Uh, it was pretty fun, but Bobby had already decided to be a priest by then, and no one needed that paper, so he's just sitting on the archive. But it's, it's, it's one of my favorite papers. I never submitted it to a journal. <laughs> I never bothered to submit it. But it, 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 but it, we can even solve it analytically, and it's quite it's quite involved. I would say it's it's you know it's it's pretty hard. Um, but yes. Uh, so the point I think one of the fun things about this is, of course you ask what kind of things I can do, but the real power of this approach is that what I'm gonna ask about is large scale patterns. And what I can do is I can put different amounts of structure into the random matrices, right? So for example, if I take these kind of uniform, then that means that metabolism nor consumer preferences have any structure. And I can ask, what can I explain with these kind of random matrices? On the other hand, I can imagine that what I have is that I have semi-block diagonal kind of matrices. And what that means is that you can imagine these are like metabolite families. This is like acetate or something. And, you know, and what happens is that if I eat certain classes of metabolites, I am very likely to produce other classes of metabolites out. So you can put different levels of metabolic structure into these things. That's a very coarse grain level. Or here species have preferences for certain kinds of things. So we know enterobacteria like sugar, we know pseudomonads are generalists, we know whatever you want, but the idea is that you can, you know, you put that in. That's one of your choices in this game. And the kind of things you can ask is that people often measure lots and lots of stuff and they say, I don't know what's happening. And so what I'm gonna show you at least, I hope is one example, yeah, I have time, uh, of how we can use this to basically test hypotheses by basically changing the setup and that way you can at least say, I can reproduce this large scale pattern that's measured qualitatively with this or not with that. But before we do that, this is old. Uh, I wanna say people asked about getting in about how you work with experimentalists. So this was a paper that we went back and forth with theory. And a lot of this was me saying that, no, 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 you can take this random matrix model and you can reproduce real data. And uh, what we did was these kind of, kind of crazy experiments where we took, um, wild, uh, we took like uh, natural communities, but we grew them in very simple environments. There's some experts, it's M9 with a single sugar. Uh, and, and we just repeatedly passaged. And you got all these kind of very striking patterns that I'm not gonna go through because this is a 40 minute talk. But I just wanna tell you that, you know, all those things we kind of predicted with the theory before we started. And, and, or at the same time, I don't know how to explain it. It was, it was kind of done at the same time, but we could reproduce almost all these patterns qualitatively, which basically told, you know, explained to us that really metabolism was shaping these communities quite a bit. 
that like if I told you what community they were grown in, they changed the environment. And that was basically this cross feeding was important in these kind of experimental settings where this was this was done. Yeah. So, so when you say some of the measured features are reproduced, what, what exactly? I mean, I mean, OK, so for example, here you see stuff like I can do many. So, OK, I can walk you some through some examples. So here, what you do is you take some natural community, right? And you passage it over and over again. So you do it, grow it up for 48 hours, then you dilute it, you grow it up, grow it up, and you ask what survives. So different colors correspond to what species are living there. And now you can look at these species or whatever you want to call them. Sorry, species are controversial in the microbial world, but whatever you want to call them, uh, something like species at, um, as a function of time. And you can look at them at different taxonomical resolutions. So you can look at them at like the level of families, you can look at, at the level of, species, ASVs as they call them now, ESVs as they were called here, and so on. And you can see lots of stuff like the relative proportion of things in a given environment is very reproducible at the family level, but not so much at the species level. So they compete and replace each other at the species level, not at the family level. You can see that if uh, I cluster these things, if I, if I, if I vary these things, um, if I look at these different inoculum and I plot the composition of these things at the family level or any level actually as a function of where they came from or the environment, um, they cluster very well based on the environment they're, they're grown in, but not very well by the color, they uh, not very much from the inoculum they come from. You can do stuff like look at Tisney's and see what, pathway, what kind of pathways you're going to be enriched for. But basically these kind of things at what level of taxonomical resolution do you have do you have um, do you have variation? Can you? I mean, at the, at the moment this thing was written, actually, people didn't actually believe you could grow up a complex community even on a single resource, because people didn't really appreciate how much the bacteria could modify their environments. So part of the, I would say, sociological impact of the paper <laughs> was to just show that competitive exclusion in the strong form doesn't exist even in these simple things, because you have to think about feedbacks from species to environment. I can show you more examples. We, 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 uh, this one is very unclear because it's like all the data of the paper in one thing, but I can show you a better example. That'll make more sense. Yeah. I, yeah? I think what I'm trying to ask is this, perhaps a simpler question. So if all you put in is a random matrix, mm -hmm. where are these features from? Uh, they're, they're from the structure I put in the random matrix. They're like, they're basically, the, basically what I'm saying is that if I have something like this, you can reproduce stuff. But if I put in something like this, I don't. So all, all this stuff you're seeing, is basically just saying there's cross feeding, that's important, and that different families have different basic general preferences. They segregate. I see. So there are some prior information you put in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You actually put in all the. You put different resolutions of information. And you ask what you need to produce the paper, and I. And to you, this seems very obvious, but I must say, when you talk to most biologists. They, when they talk about mechanism, they don't talk about it here. This is too abstract for them. Mm -hmm. What it's going to be about is molecules and all this stuff, but it's not, uh, it's not clear at that level of molecular detail the, is important for these patterns. These patterns are somehow the typical. Most of the stuff that people measure in high dimensions is the typical stuff. It actually is very depressing. It doesn't have anything <laughs> to do with most of the biology. It just tells you about these very coarse grained constraints. Yes. You said we should argue with you. So yeah, of course. That. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, so in, in a sense, what you're saying is that if you started with a random matrix, what you originally proposed, it doesn't work. And then you have to put structure in the matrix. So it's no longer really random. Well, it's random up to a block diagonal. It's a random block <laughs> diagonal structure. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But I think that's the power of the approach. I'm not saying that we're really doing something, but we're saying it's very hard when you do these very large scale measurements to relate the pattern you see, which is very far removed from the assumptions you make. And it's very easy to do this. And, and if you wanna do it yourself, we wrote a Python package to make it very easy for everyone to do it themselves, right? And it's like very easy to use. We figured out some stuff about how to map this to an opt, how to do turn, instead of forward integrating stiff ODEs, we can map it to optimization problem, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of tricks hidden in there that are, make it numerically stable. But it's fun, yeah. So can one then say that the level at which you can explain the data that you find in experiment really depends on the level of 
non-randomness that level of structure that you put in the matrix because you have these blobs. Yeah, I, th I think that's the only thing you learn from these models. You can say, what assumptions do I have to put into the, what constraints, yeah. ecological in this case, or biological are really important for producing this because it's very easy to over-interpret the data. I would say in biology, especially in sequencing data, sequencing based data, let's put it that way, not you microscopists who really measure stuff carefully, but when you get to sequencing data, I would say it's very easy and people tend to over-interpret the data. <laughs> they tend to see a pattern and they seem to think that it's some very special thing. Whereas what I would say is a lot of what you see in the least large scale sequencing data is the generic thing you would see if you put in the minimal amount of biology and ecology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, whoever wants to go, yes. Okay, so I, I, I want is, is, is the same question. Top. So you yeah. put in this particular structure, so it will de your output is gonna depend on what structure you put in. Yes. So which means, can I show you one more example that might make this more yeah, clear? Is it, is it then predictive at all, or is not so predictive? Uh, it, it generates hypotheses. I wouldn't call them predictive models. I would call them, A, uh, I think they kill a lot of hypotheses, because most of the time, if you read the papers, you read very detailed explanations that seem to overinterpret the data. The second thing is, let me show you an example of, let me show you another example that's easier to understand. All right? Uh, before you go on, could yeah. I, I mean, you've chosen, Two examples for your matrices. You, you, you recall you said, please yeah. let, le, let me go. Yeah. Sort of thing. So my question to you is, I could have chosen things which were block diagonal, self-similar on many scales. Yeah, so we generally uh, interpret. Do, does your fit to the data show that that's not the we, case? We never fit the data. We just we try to put it. Well, does your very subjective comparison with this intricate data tell you anything about the block diagonal structure beyond just simple blocks? Uh, the data is not good enough. I mean, okay. I, I, in principle, we could do it, but the data is very crude. <laughs> and uh, let me let me show you an example where we really, it's very clear we can, uh, it's very clear we can say something. Like, like, okay. like, a, a very, very, very concrete thing. Uh, uh, yeah. Can I ask you a small yeah. question? Sure. So, uh, so if you go back one slide, yeah. uh, so you have this like, um, this one? This uh, one? No, this one, yeah. yeah. So you have this, uh, you know, this uh, genome sequencing data, what you, uh, you're you yeah. showing the relative... It's not genome sequencing, it's, it's 16S. Oh, it's so 16S. Really... So you were <laughs> showing the relative loads and stuff like that. So what I'm asking is like many times, if you continue it longer, sometimes it see like the, 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 the distribution flips, like you have Enterobacter and Pseudomonas. No, no, no. This is, after here, we stop it after, so this is 48 times 12. After this, what happens is things start evolving. So, so it, it's very stable. You can see this is in time, 12 dilutions, they're 48 hours. So this is, it, it stabilizes pretty much. And this is replicates. So these are eight replicates of each thing. So we're pretty, we're pretty confident. So that... you, you mean like <laughs> when, when it flips, it's basically that your, your, uh, the, the dependence, cross dependence of the different metabolites will also change beco because of that. And yeah. that's what, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the idea. Um, yeah, that's the Terry. I, I, I'm proud of this one because Terry hated it so much. Terry Hua, he went and did a bunch of careful experiments. So whenever you can get Terry upset doing experiments, <laughs> I feel like you've won. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's an insider joke, I guess. Insider baseball is the same comedy. Um, all right. So let me show you the kind of things that people do with large scale things. And maybe is this the example I kept. Okay, yeah. So let me show you the kind of things people do. So there was this giant effort called the Earth Microbiome Project, where they went and they just got bacterial communities and they sequenced them, and they saw what lived there, right? And so you pay, you know, whatever, $5 million, you have to write a nature paper, so you have to say what you learned from it, right? And so it's a beautiful project. I don't mean to disparage it, but I, I, I mean, this is just the kind of, they were like, it's kind of like this data collecting exercise that I think is quite necessary. But the kind of thing they kind of argued was something like this, that like, so this was what they call nestedness. So the, if you read the abstract, they're like, oh, the thing is nested, which means this. So the Y axis here are different taxa, which you can just think of, you know, species. Like, so these are which bacteria are found and here are different communities. Okay, so these are all these communities <coughs> that are coming here. And what you can see is that the species that are found, so you can see that the 
communities are sorted by richness. So these communities here have the most species that live in them. These are the most diverse, rich, and these are the ones with the fewest species that live there here, they live too. And what you can see is the species that live in the least abundant communities, in the least diverse, least rich communities also live in the most rich communities. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the statement that this is kind of upper diagonal. Yes. So what do the colors mean anything? The colors are <coughs> the source of the source of the there, there's different things. There's animal associated, there's host associated, there's like soil associated ocean. So the colors mean that. So, so this is over all microbiomes? Over all microbiomes. All that they could actually measure. Yeah, they measured a lot. <laughs> okay. They measured a lot. All right. So the question is what what, what does this mean? <laughs> right? That's how I'm, I'm always like, how do I interpret this thing? And so actually it turns out that you generically choose any random matrices you want, and you just get this pattern for free. Like it just, it's impossible not to get it. No constraints at all. No constraints at all, nothing. You always get it. And so we were trying to figure out why you get it. And, and so we just sent in the paper to the referee and the referee was like, come on guys. You gotta tell me when the pattern when the pattern doesn't work. How do you break the pattern? Otherwise, I haven't learned anything. Very great referee, actually, one of the best referee reports I've ever gotten. And we we're like, all right, we'll try. So we kept on trying. Bobby kept on trying. We, I'm acting like I was tired. Bobby was tired of simulating stuff. I did nothing uh, except be like, go, Bobby. Uh, <laughs> yes. So uh, could you explain a little bit about how you set up the simulation? Yeah. So the simulation said like this. So what we do is we just have a meta community is using this thing, right? And we just sample from this big regional species pool and we just dump some and let it grow up, all right? And what we do is we just sample different resources. Oh, okay, so, so what do you mean, I mean, I mean I'm sort of what is being sampled here, so. So, I, I, so what I do is I set up a regional species pool of some kind. Okay, so you have some species. Of I have some species that could potentially colonize things. So this is a great thing because this is going to be important for the next thing. So what I do is I don't have a board, but I basically have a bunch of species. And what they can do is, I'm imagining there's, this is the way ecologists often think about it. They say there's a regional global species pool. And what's happening is in different places, different things migrate and some of them survive and some of them don't survive, uh -huh. right? And so what we did is we just set up, drew a bunch of random species, Thousand, ten thousand. We subsample them, and in, and we just put different resources, different combinations of resources, different random environments in them, and then let them grow out to steady the state. Species is defined by sort of the columns in there. Yeah, by, the species is defined by the columns exactly. The species is basically defined by what okay. you can eat. So you have one interaction matrix, and then you have different environment matrices. And not, not, no, the environment no. matrix is also All universal. Services. What changes is what if you go back to the equations. The environment comes in through what resources are present. Okay, so they're different, different resources. Okay. They're different you resources. Sample them until you're in equilibrium. Yeah. Okay. And and what you get essentially is that you always get this. Yeah, the colors. No, but yeah, I don't have the colors. Uh, we should have colored. We should have arbitrarily colored it. You laugh, you laugh, but this is what theory and biology often is, unfortunately. Like you know, the number of times people have told me to put a p-value on something that didn't deserve a p-value is just. It's like yeah, I can come up with a terrible null hypothesis and make my p look ten to the minus twelve. Who cares? Or like, either you believe it or you don't believe it. So in the end, it turned out that the only way to break it was that. If we started when we did this set up the simulation from the regionally regional species pool, what we did was that we actually put very few colonizers. And so what was limiting what was ended up in a community was not the self organization and competition for resources, but instead the colonization of what got there in the first place. All right. So, yeah. So is um when you run this multiple times, is is it the case that the the uh, the resources that correspond to the less rich communities are always the same ones? Yes, is there's that, harsher and less harsher so environments. So I see. So so not the same ones always, but right, roughly but speaking. There's like a, so there's um, I see. Yeah. And you can change that by changing this parameter m. I somewhere here the har harshness of a you can you can basically randomly sample this too. And it tells you about, and you take it the same for all, you know, all, all, all. What dominates all these things is we also randomly sample this harshness. 
And we say that depends on the environment because you can just, you can read it. it so the claim is that, a, uh, or at least one interpretation of your model is that a particular, a particular environment um, admits a certain amount of cross-feeding essentially, like a certain number yeah, of- Yeah, and, and, and it's and and different amounts of portions. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I, I think what's mostly driving it it does that if you what's mostly driving it is that you can imagine some things are more toxic because they have higher pH or lower pH if you look through it. So that's basically variations in this intrinsic death rate, which this basically sets how harsh an environment is. So you're basically dominated by that most of the time. But you can also be structured by resources. The statistics of the distribution of that don't matter for no, they don't matter for this for other things they matter. I can show you another example where that matters. But here, what seems to happen is that as long as I have selection, you have some fitter species, and they always appear in everywhere, and everyone else is not fit. And if what's dominating what ends up there is what gets there in the first place, the colonization, then you lose this pattern. Right? So it just gives you some ecological hypothesis, because it turns out that most of the patterns that people measure are very simple. So this is another example from Otto Cordero's lab that I'm not going to talk about, because I have five minutes. But the point is here, the metabolic structure matters, right? So you can't do it with random matrices. You have to put some family level things. So in that way, you can like, you know, is, you, you can check these patterns that are very hard to draw hypotheses about. You can relate them at least to some hypotheses of what's going on. And what I'd like to argue is that a lot of the stuff that people make big stories on, you get generically with random matrices. That's all, that's all I'm trying to say qualitatively. You would think that this is a succession where you, you grow bacteria in some environment, they kind of, you know, you get some that come out early colonizers, they die off, so this is time, and other ones come, and other ones go, and then you get, end up with something, and you would think that requires some fine tuning. It doesn't. You get it completely for free for all random matrices. Then there's this other thing where people check if I grow things on two different <laughs> carbon sugars, but then I grow them together, the, the what survives on the combined sugar looks like a linear uh, sum of the things that's grown separately on each thing. That requires this kind of, that requires some family level structure and you can kind of understand that something specialized in resource A, something specialized in resource B. If I put resource A and B together, they kind of compete within themselves, but not across each other and you get that for free. Whereas the succession you get for free no matter what. So in this way, you can start asking, when should I be surprised, right? In some ways, what I'm advocating for is making much, much better null models <laughs> in bio of biological, complex biological phenomenon. And in high dimensions, I would argue that's possible. Whereas in low dimensions, it's very hard because every detail might matter. So in the last slide, yeah. uh, sort of following on the same line, yeah. when should you be surprised? So should it be surprising that there are some rows yeah. where you find empty, sp empty spots, so like both in your simulation and in the data. So would that be where w what interesting stuff is happening? I, I, would guess, I would guess that's where like really the details start mattering yeah. at that level, right? Yeah, well, I think that's the level at which details start mattering. Yeah, right, at one resolution down. Right. And, and then, then you can ask, how do I break that pattern? So I mean, I think, I think this is really arguing for phenomenology of certain kinds. Mm -hmm with the kind of data that's very hard generally to do phenomenology on. That's I, I would, what I would say, yeah. All right, I'm supposed to be done, so there's gonna be no part two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's no part two, I guess. But, it, but um, or, or I do part two and people keep on interrupting me. It's up to you, whatever you guys want. Well, Total on questions is, we've had 10 minutes at least of questions. Yeah. So keep going. Okay. So let me just show you that this is not something just in one setting. So here, we've been doing this for a long time. We started off with my old student, Alex Lang, who was my other postdoc, Charles Fisher, is now Charles's startup worth way too much money. One day we're gonna get him to fund our theory group, whatever he sells out his company. <laughs> Though he's been in Silicon Valley so long. Um, so they're all, and I'm currently doing this with my wonderful student, Maria, and my very long time stem cell, MD, well, Harold's an MD PhD. He really wants to just repair lungs. And Laertes, who started off as a chemical engineer, but is like a pure stem cell biologist. And I couldn't have done this without their input. It's like, it's amazing how much like 
even though it's all very theoretical, you like there's some grounding that just comes from meeting weekly with experimental biologists since that was brought up so much. That's just absolutely necessary to not make your theories trash, I would say. Uh, um, so I, again, it's a very broad audience, but so I just wanted to tell you that, you know, I think most of you know, you start off as a single cell, you turn into many different kinds of cells and what just makes the difference between say, some kind of stomach cell or a lung cell is that different genes are turned on and off in these different cells, all right? right? Different cell types express distinct genes. And that's the starting point of all this stuff. Um, and I think uh, anyone who's close to biology knows that now it's possible to measure gene expression at the single cell level, right? And so what you can do is you can take a cell, you can lyse it, and then what you can do is this is each of these columns is a single cell, each of these things is a gene, and what you can do is you can, you know, you can count the number of RNAs. It's not really proteins, it's count the number of RNAs, and you get this extremely high dimensional noisy data. Right? And, and, and it's pretty cool because, you know, it's amazing, and, you know, it's, it's, it's an industry. I think that's the only way to describe it. And, you know, and I think a major, major thing that people are trying to do now is build humongous atlases. So, you know, you have a human cell atlas, neural cell atlas, your favorite organ has a sub-atlas. We're way too familiar with this single cell lung atlas, you know, development. They all have their peculiarities, but people are making these atlases like this, right? And, and um, it's, it's kind of amazing data, but again, it comes from this thing, this high dimensional data. How do we think about it? And here, I think people, really think they know how to analyze this data a lot. Um, I'm a contrarian at heart. So um, I'll show you what I think is going on and what I think is maybe slightly different. But the other thing I should point out is this is like, you know, a cartoon of <laughs> lung development. So this is, you know, of mice. So at 8.5, you have these early cells, you start getting branching from days 11 to 16.5. And then you get this kind of lung pointing out from day 16.5 to 18.5 and then to the, two weeks that the mouse is out of birth, they finally get exposed to air. The surfactant interface, actually the air liquid interface has a big thing in finally developing these cells. So this is like, you know, these process, and this is like when different cell types appear as a function of time, right? It's not really gonna be important, but what's going on is that this is, for example, some, some lung specification gene network. It's all very complicated. So each of these things is the genes and you see a lot of arrows, which is the usual, Thing, and I'm supposed to understand what's going on here, but I never do. <laughs> Though now I know many of the names. That's, that's what's happened in 15 years. I still don't understand these things, but I recognize the names now. So, um, so, you know, one of the things that's kind of interesting, and I think especially in a meeting about emergence, is that if you talk to a cell biologist, they kind of just inherently believe in this Waddington landscape, which Conrad Waddington hanging out in Cambridge in the theoretical biology group in Cambridge, as he called it, in the 1950s, basically said he was doing these really amazing early embryology experiments. And basically, the classic picture, this is from his famous book, The Strategy of Genes. And he basically said, look, the way we should think about development is in terms of some kind of potential landscape. The minima correspond to different cell fates. And you know you have this developmental potential, and it's in time you get restricted in potential, and you end up in these things, in the in these minima, and that is like the emergent property of what development is about. And it really is emergent because he even has a second picture. This is before DNA is discovered, where he has these little things that are genes, and he imagines this landscape that's emerging and being held up by these genes. So it's really this idea of a very abstract concept that somehow has made it to the center of embryology quite early, right? Actually, he's dying and it made it come back after this, after you could measure all these single cell RNA seq data. So this is called the Waddington landscape. Um, and just to be clear, development looks like this potential. And, you know, these networks is something that gives rise to this potential. That's the way people like to think about it. But there's something really, as a physicist, the first time I saw it, the second time I saw it, the third time I saw it, <laughs> every time I look at it, it's, not, it just, it's fine for three seconds, then you look at it for 10 <laughs> seconds, and you're like, what does this picture mean? And the fundamental problem are, what are the coordinates? 
what sets the scales? You know, the first thing they tell you in physics, like what's the natural scales? What's the coordinates? And I kind of got obsessed with that problem and have been for the last 10, 15 years, right? And I think what's interesting is that actually this, you know, people are trying to now visualize this and use this Waddington landscape, you know, metaphor to try to understand all this Atlas data because they're measuring single cell gene expression in time and space. And did I mess this up? Did I mess up the org? All right. So, oh yeah, here, here we go. That's the slide I went too forward too far. But so what people do is they take this high dimensional data that's like 20,000 genes or something and they project it down to low dimensions. And this is a U map. This is like, uh, this is a staple of uh, single cell biology. And then, you know, or you could do some other thing. And then what you see is you imagine things running around you label cells and you say they move on this two dimensional landscape, but I asked the same question about real data. What are the coordinates? What are the scales? And it somehow leaves you very unsatisfied because you're imagining this dynamics, but you don't, have a, you don't have a natural coordinate system. You don't have a sense of scale of what's closer far. And in fact, many of the techniques that people use to analyze this data because it's so noisy actually manipulates, takes advantage of that to make data look much better than it is just regularly, I would say. <laughs> Those of you who worked with this know that could be a fact. And that's why I actually got into this project. The stem cell biologists were like, we wanna make these artificial lung cells. Can you tell me how much they look like real cells? And so we're like, oh, I'm sure. There's like oh, a million packages to do this. I'm sure we can just figure it out. And it turned out, you know, if you dig a little bit, you're like, oh gosh. <laughs> and the fundamental problem is that there's no coordinates and scales. I would say that's that's fundamentally what's going on. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question. So here there is a coordinate in the figures, which is the level of expression for the RNA, right? Oh no, no, it's twenty thousand. It's twenty thousand genes, yeah, yeah, and then they projected it in some kind of. These are principal components, or something. No, this is this is a diffusion map. This oh. is a U map. Okay. Which are just nonlinear dimensional reduction. Yeah. So, but that's techniques. not the coordinate in your one. No, that's not the, I would like meaningful coordinates, right? Like, <laughs> and I would like meaningful scales, right? I mean, in physics, we would not do this. Let me just put it that way. We would want meaningful coordinates and meaningful scales, right? Um, so we need to think about how to properly mathemat mathemat mathematically formulate this and use this to plot data, right? And, and the claim is that the same philosophy actually helps you a lot to do this because, you know, and in particular, we want to do stuff like identify cell fates, visualize developmental trajectories and reasonable coordinates, quantitatively assess cell similarity because people are trying to engineer these cells in vitro. Uh, in vitro was a fancy word for not in the body. It took me a long time to learn that. <laughs> and um, so the basic idea is again by Wigner, right? What we should do is just like Wigner said, okay, I just replace the complexity with randomness. As long as I enforce the constraint, what I'm going to do with these networks is I'm going to say, actually, the details of these connections don't matter at all. I just have some constraints. And the constraint is that I need a network in high dimensions whose attractors correspond to the known cell types. All right, so that's all I'm going to ask. That, that, that after that, I'm just going to guess what's going on. And so there is something that we know that does this, right? So the idea is model interactions as random networks with constraints that are attract, whose attractors, oh my goodness, I should, shouldn't have made this yesterday, uh, are gene expression patterns from cell atlases. So I go to the cell atlas, I know what genes I need to be expressed. Those are my attractors. And there is a connection in spin glass physics. There is a set of models in spin glass physics for, and computational neuroscience that do this. It's called the, they're called the Hoffield model. And they're basically, the idea is, that you know you have you choose the connections in a particular way such that the things I care about are the global minima of this thing. All right. Uh, you can't quite use the Hoffield model for technical reasons, right? Uh, we started off with the Hoffield model a decade ago. Maria has built it. Uh, the real challenge is that this data is noisy, sparse, and continuous, and the cell types are very, the attractors are actually highly correlated. And the original Hoffield construction doesn't work for correlated stuff. So we've been playing a lot with um, what are now called um, modern Hoffield networks. 
But the basic idea we're going to do is that we've created this big machine. And it's not big, that's the machine, but it's like a three equation machine <laughs> where, where we, um, we kind of can generalize this Hoffield construction. And what we get out of it are some interesting things. So the idea is that xi is the expression of gene i. And then the attractors I want are the expression of gene i in cell mu. So this is, this is my attractors. I get those from these atlases. And what I do is I can actually now construct order parameters a la Hoffield, which are like magnetizations that tell you how aligned am I <laughs> with the cell type of interest. So these are order parameters. And then what I can do is I can make some generalized Landau-like free energy, and then I can make a very funny dynamics on it. Turns out this is the modern Hoffield network. For anyone who knows what a transformer is, it's very related to transformers, which are the things behind these large language models. But it's basically this dynamics where I almost take the gradient of the free energy, but there's a nonlinear function that's what do you different. choose for V A, V sub A. Uh, that is set by, for example, the bifurcation. It, it can be either zero if you want a static picture, or if you want to think about cell types becoming unstable and stable, it's usually the normal form for these bifurcations that are a la Eric, Sigio. So, so there are no quartic terms and things uh, like there that? There are quartic terms if you want them. Yes, there are. Because they're, that, that's, how you, that's, how, that's the only way you can get these bifurcations. OK. Hmm. Right? But, but, the, but the important point is they have to be covariant in this space. It doesn't matter. There's some technical stuff I definitely will not tell you about, but it's a kind of an interesting construction. Yeah. Pangesh, you didn't resolve the problem of the coordinates. Oh, the coordinates are going to be my order parameters. Mm. Okay, but the coordinates you had before were just the size. Right, but I'll show you some data. I have five minutes, so let me let me tell you something. So you construct a reference basis. This is too technical, but the basic idea is this. Using this Hoffield like construction, I can go from gene space onto this order parameter space. So I can get as many order parameters as, as attractors as I want. And I can take the gene expression and now I can visualize it in this cell type space, which is one if it's perfectly aligned at zero, if it's around zero, if it's random. Yes. So, um... Typically here, we would be in a situation where the number of attractors is much, much, much smaller than the number of dimensions, right? Okay. But, but, but even then, the nonlinear, the modern Hopfield networks, you can get exponential numbers. That's what this yeah, nonlinear yeah, exactly. is. Yeah, but like, you don't really need I don't need that. Right? I, don't, I need that for the continuity. What this helps with is actually the continuity. You can modify this in a million ways. I'm happy, if you're an expert, I'm happy to tell you about all the ways you can Modify it. So this is not exactly a modern Hopfield network because it doesn't conserve energy. It doesn't have a Lyapunov function. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's kind of a generalization of Dima's construction. So, so your dynamics is not a relaxational dynamics. Mm, no, because there's a nonlinearity. It's a, it, it's actually almost like a gradient. It's almost like Landau thing, but you live on a simplex of the order parameters. Mm. That's how. That's one way of thinking about these modern Hopfield networks. Sorry, what sigma is, is a function there? Or sigma, sigma is a non sigma is a soft max. If yeah, that yeah, means yeah. anything to okay. you. Okay. <laughs> so you, yes. said you said there's no Lyapunov function. So how do you ensure that you don't get limit cycles or, or something like this? You can have. Mm -hmm. uh, here you. you could have. In principle, though, we never find them in practice. But you could, and that's, that's, that's what the sense of my question. Yeah. It doesn't have to go to fixed points. I mean, it does because you're almost, it, it's not quite a hirsch mail system, uh -huh. but it's almost a hirsch mail system because I'm basically doing this gradient descent. It's yes. almost me. <laughs> Most of the time. I mean, in the sense that I have a potential, I take the derivative, yes. right? And then I live on a, I move in a simplex in the direction of this gradient. Yes. Okay. But everything, but the, I, I live, like if, so the metric is degenerate, is like because in horse smell you have a more smell you have a metric that. But it's also the non gradient descent. Yeah, but there's also a non there's also a nonlinearity here that makes it very much not more more spell. Couldn't you observe that in the potential? You can't because it's a it's it's a soft max on derivatives. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But so uh, we come back to the question of the parameters, right? So you started with the xi's, which are sort of relatively meaningless because they're noisy, and also yeah. what the yeah. quantity of a gene. You know, means depends on what gene it is, and now you inner product this with a vector, and now you have a different coordinate system. Yeah, so that's it. Nice is better. Yeah, but it reduces dimensionality a lot. You really yeah. add, and you get rid of the noise, but also because you're taking all the noise and you're averaging it. So let me show you the kind of things you can do. All right, 
I'm not going to show you. There's, there's, there's another trick that I am not telling you, which is that you have the D. Doesn't matter. Not, not enough time. Five minutes. Let me show you one picture. Let me show you a couple of pictures. All right. So here is the same lung development. All right. And here you see all these cell types that are sitting out here, AT1 and AT2, club cell, ciliated, neurocyclic, neuroartery, secretory, or somewhere over here, they're goblet cells. Um, and what you, you've done is we've just colored them. And now what we've done is we've plotted these in order parameter space. So we can calculate the order parameters on all cell types at the same time. And I just now look at a two-dimensional slice through that. And so the order parameters, the size are fitted by... Size are not fitted. No. They're just taken out of the atlas. There's no fitting in the whole no thing, fitting. right? So it's just AT1 axis is just a dot product of... It's not quite a dot product. It's not quite okay, okay, let me tell you what it is. It's, there's enough questions. What it is, is that because they're correlated, what you have to first do is calculate this overlap matrix, the correlation matrix, oh, A, okay. and then multiply by inverse. So this was the cantor zempelinski projection method. You can throw that into the modern Hoffield network too. But it's basically, I, I, I don't know how much you know the neural network literature, but this basically is what decorrelates. This is what takes care of the correlations. But this also is calculated directly from the atlas. So in some sense, it's a projection onto the unique genes for that cell type. Is that a fair? Uh, it's a projection. Sorry, sorry. It's, a, it's in some way, or it, I mean, not exactly. It's more like a metric it's in the order. It's more like the order parameters don't live in a, Manifold whose metric is given by the correlation between the uh, with these things. It's more like a sigma model, if that means anything. <laughs> it doesn't. It, 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 yeah, it, it's basically saying that when I look at the distance, these two vectors are always going to be the same, so I should reweigh by that angle, but on a but not in a two vector way, in a global way. <laughs> it's an orthogonal projection. It, it, it's literally this picture. What it does is it takes the cell type space. Right, without the nonlinearity, takes the cell type space and it just basically dumps it onto the plane in an orthogonal manner onto that cell space. That's literally what it is. It's just an orthogonal projection onto the space. That's the best way to explain it. Yes. So this is a linearized uh, procedure to solve the nonlinear problem. Are the linear coefficients around a fixed point, or, or how do you determine the linearized coefficients? The linear. Uh, oh, oh, well, you can just make that into. You can take that on linearity and make it into the identity function. It's 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 like it's like a it's like a high it's like a high temperature expansion of the softmax. So if you take a Fermi function and you take it a high temperature, it becomes linear in in beta. So you can think of it that way. Anyway, we're done because it's a long day. But all I want to show you is that you have these cell types that are basically the same, and you can plot them, and you can really separate out these kind of cell types by what's going on. So if I plot out AT1 and AT2, you see all the AT2, and this is with really noisy single cell RNA-seq data. And each point here is a cell. And what you can see is I can take the AT2s, they sit here, the AT1s, so here you have some kind of weird transient things that sim that are going to play more of a role when I show you some atlas data and I plot it. It does this. I can choose a different coordinate system, ciliated in AT1, and you see that the AT2 in this axis sit near the origin. The ciliated cells come back up. The AT2 stay here. And, you know, so, you know, here's lung development. This is what people think about this differentiation process. But what's nice about this is so here's a movie where each point is a cell. And what you see here are the days. So day 12.5, we're just watching data that they took in an atlas that goes from here. And what you can see is you start off with progenitor cells that sit here. And over time, right, you can watch this kind of population come here, move to the middle, spread out, and kind of disappear. And so now we can watch developmental trajectories in a meaningful coordinate system. And this meaningful coordinate system is basically inspired by this idea that if I get the attractors right, something we'd all accept in physics, if I get the order parameters right, I don't have to worry about all the details. You can do similar things. And I have many, many more examples of this kind of thing. But I'm done. Everyone's done. Do you prescribe the, the bifurcation type here? Here? No, this is real data. 
But so this is without this, but you had this potential V. No, no, and here I'm just plotting, I'm just plotting this, uh, here I'm just literally just, oh, this is just using the coordinate system. Of the data. This is just a presentation of the data. So I say, once I accept the model, what it tells me is I should plot everything in order parameter space. Mm -hmm. And you can plot all the single cell developmental direct stuff from atlases, use bases from across labs. There's, you, you don't have to worry about batch effects. There's amazing thing, and it looks, very meaningful. That's what I. Relaxation, not quite more smells thing. That that's not relevant here. But that's not here yet. And I took that all out of the talk once I knew it was going to be a forty-minute talk. <laughs> so, so I'm done. So, I, but I, I just want to. Oh, I have a chat GPT joke at the end. <laughs> okay, I have a quick question about this. So, what would this look like if you just if you did the standard, you know, the quote-unquote standard analysis where it looks like it looks like this. You know, it looks, it looks, it, uh, maybe I have it here, but it looks something like this. These are these, this is the 81, 82 precursors. This is that hybrid orange populations. These are, I don't know how they're colored. You could color them by pseudo time or something like that, but that's, that's, that's how people visualize it right now. That's a U map. That's what people would say. Maybe you could color code these with time and see some thing or, uh, did I take out the other one? Did I take out Alone's paper, alone stuff? I, I can show you lots of examples. I mean, the, I, of how it's done, but it's usually done in UMAP space, is what I would tell you. And in UMAP space, it's very hard to tell what's going on. <laughs> I mean, maybe you know something different, but that's usually how it's done. Yeah, I don't. I don't necessarily disagree. I just, I guess. Um, the question of whether how how much better your coordinate system is, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but that's for you to judge and yeah. us to uh, me to show you more examples. I, I can show you lots of examples. So what we can tell you is we can do it off the shelf, take data from one atlas, take data from a third lab, fourth lab, and it all works without any fits, right? Which is somewhat surprising. If you this is all this, this, is, this, is a, this is all some dimensional reduction which requires some fit and optimization. Uh, to get this right, this does. Yeah, this yeah, UMAP. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah. a nonlinear demand yeah. thing. To do and if you don't have any, you don't have any intuition about what these coordinates mean. No, you yeah. don't have any intuition, much intuition. Right. And and people want to take vector fields in these coordinates seriously. There's a there's there's a whole machine that's been built on this that I find quite problematic. Let me put it that way. All right, we're done. It's a very long day. Uh, you know, so it says. It's a, I don't know, this is what ChatGPT, so I asked ChatGPT3, maybe four has a different answer. Can I use Wigner's idea to describe uranium? And he said, maybe it's not as straightforward as uranium, but uh, it might be useful. So maybe. <laughs> that's a typical ChatGPT answer. Yeah, exactly. So at least I haven't pissed off the AI overlords right now. So anyway, thank you. This is my group, these people funded. If you're all willing to. Well, so so could you uh, so there's also like uh, atlases of gene uh, information for cancer cells, right? Yeah, we're playing with that. Oh, so okay. what, what's the most interesting thing about it? Yeah. Oh, for all these people who'd like to know, um, what's interesting is that we've been trying to figure out if you take cell lines and primary things, what's the main thing? So it turns out if you grow them in 2D, they they all look like 2D things. And as soon as you grow them in a 3D condition, the cancer thing, that's the only time they actually look like the not in vivo cell type. So the 3D versus 2D is everything in the cancer cell. <laughs> it's kind of very amazing cell life. That's a, you know, there's also like for, uh, he's not trying to do a whole industry. I know, right. I know I don't mean the Of doing like drug, drug treatment on 2D cell cultures and 3D cell cultures. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we got into this because my former, one of my former, one of the former people who worked in the theory group with me and Carol is now at the Broad, and they're applying, uh, you know, she, Lauren's applying this, she's applying everything to this, and that was the interesting thing we found, that, like, yeah. we were very surprised that the 2D versus 3D-ness yeah. the cancer cells is dominating all the gene expression. This doesn't really know anything it's about more important the thing, but, like, all the 2D things just look like each other, and don't really look like any of the... 
you know, the vivo most stuff. Of, most of the data sets have problems in a sense that you take a tumor and you boil down, break down the tumor, and then you do it, you lose all the spatial information in the RNA-seq data. Or high chips, yeah, but and everything, it's, it's whatever you do. Than that, you take the TCGA, yeah. yeah, right? And you just take all the established lines, because Broad is trying, because Pharma cares about it. I mean, so we, the, so yeah. we know about the necrotic core in cancer tumor, but the, these data completely ignores all those things. Yeah, even if you homogenize yeah. them, they don't get it right, is what I'm trying to tell you. It, it's, it's even worse. It's at a yeah. scale even before that, that right. you're getting things wrong. <laughs> and and the, 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 the surprising thing about the whole thing is that, like, you know, in the same community will tell you that the same mutation is not going to cause cancer. It is this environment which will de determine if this mutation will result in cancer. But when it comes to the actual tumors, uh, RNA sequencing or uh, data, that it takes the whole tumor as a whole. So, yeah. No, yeah, so I, I might have that somewhere on my Slack if anyone wants yeah. to see it. It's kind of really astounding how but to do that, you have to believe your axes enough that you can you believe that things overlap or not. Well, see, we have we 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 haven't won over a single computational biologist. Okay, come yet. on, let's. Leave.